Hey guys and girls, excited to be back at Manuka Studios with Mike McCarthy and we're going to be chatting about how to get the best audio, the best sound out of your home studio mic and vocal setup. The results are, can be fantastic, you know, if, if, you, mm. if you follow these few little rules I'm going to give you, you can get astonishing results at home, in a bedroom. So this studio is where I actually recorded my album, Life is Better With You. We did everything in here and through in the other room and uh, a lot of mics work with arranging and obviously engineering, mixing as well. We were, we were chatting about a, the move for a lot of people to doing things at home, whether it's for uh, a promotional video, whether it's for a YouTube cover, whether it's for an album that you're doing as a singer-songwriter at home, what are the most common uh, issues that you get when someone sends you something for mastering or yep. an overall, uh, maybe a remix or, or that sort of thing? Sure. What are the most common problems you get with the, with the vocal tracks? There are a few that, that stick out yeah. straight away come to mind. Not many. It's usually three things. Like, number one, there's clipping or distortion. Mm -hmm in a few places on the vocal. Secondly, plosives or popping. Mm -hmm. And that's tied in with mic placement and something we call the proximity effect, which mm -hmm. I'm going to explain. That's very, so that's three. Th and there's a fourth, which can be really problematic, which we can probably talk about at some stage, and that's the issue of sibilance, mm. which is something you've got to know how to deal with reasonably early on when you're recording. So th those are the four sure. things. Take care of those and really you can get a fantastic result with the mastery. Nice. So let's let's talk about the, the clipping then. Right. Where, <coughs> where does that happen and, and how does that... Your clipping is going to happen primarily where your mic plugs into your audio interface. What you've got to watch, when you're recording at home, you've got your audio interface with your mic going in and there's a preamp on that. A little mm -hmm. knob with the preamp, right? And that is where most of the clipping happens. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people make the mistake, they watch their, their DAW or the door program, checking, oh my levels are good there, in fact they're quite low, what's the problem? Meanwhile, they're actually clipping distortion onto the vocal at the very beginning. Mm. And that's that crucial entry where your mic, you're not going to overload the mic. It mm. takes a hell of a level to overload a mic, so that's safe. But the next chain after your mic is your audio interface, your USB interface or your little mixer, whatever you're using. Mm -hmm. It's critical to get that level right. So the way to do it, most interfaces will have a little overload uh, light, a little red sure. LED, right? So I'm going to show you how to set that peak LED. Now imagine if this was your input, that is obviously clipping too much, right? So you adjust this, keep singing, and adjust this back. There. If I turn one more notch to the right, there, it's just starting to clip. You can see that. I would back it off one more, and she's good. That's what you want to see on your vocal at all times. Well, it's running at optimum, but it's... it's uh, loud enough to keep the noise that's in your system to a minimum. That's a healthy level. So what happens is, they might say that, then of course as you get into that, and you've been going at this now half an hour and you're really enjoying it, you're getting louder. <laughs> or mm -hmm. you might get a wee bit closer. As, this, as your session progresses, you're getting a little bit closer to the mic, and the closer you get, the louder it gets. And then, if you don't check it again, mm. These occasional, it's the occasional bursts that are the problem. Like sure. I'll have a nice track in front of me, like I said, and most of it's fine. Mm. But there's in the bridge, that big note at the start of the bridge, there's a, it, it comes across as a nasty crackle. Mm -hmm. And you can't get rid of it. You, once it's recorded like that, it's that. <laughs> yeah. Also, so, what tends to at the end of the song, where things cook up as well, you, mm -hmm. you might start your levels go up so you've got to actually my advice is put your USB interface or whatever your interface is that you plugged into with your mic 
Put mm -hmm. it somewhere where you can see it at all times while you're recording. So yeah. that you can keep an eye on that little meter. Right. That's crucial. Don't put it somewhere where you can't, or you have to turn your head because then you're going to change the sound midway. You can't do that. You've got to have it somewhere. Like if I was recording through this mic here, which is my mm -hmm. talk back, sometimes I have to record something to show a client mm -hmm. something. There's my, my vocal meter, or mm -hmm. right here, there's another one. You, you can work while you watch the level. Sure. So that's number one. That's how you avoid getting your clipping. Nice. The second one we said, oh, popping. So, or is yeah. it covered anything else you want to well, No, it's great. Uh, let's, I think let's talk about plosives and, and popping. Mm. This is a real problem on a lot of tracks that come in because, again, in the heat of the moment, the guys just don't seem to pick it up. Sure. And yes, you can get rid of it to some extent, but it's it's a tricky procedure. You've got to use a clever bit of yeah. technique and, and you've got to be able to get into the wave file. So if it's on a mastering job where it's mixed, sure. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing you can do. And I mean it's frustrating as well for I'm just saying at home, mm. you've just done ah, oh, I've got a great take. Yes. Excellent, happy, you listen back, suddenly Ah, now there's okay, a couple the of chorus. things you can do. I oh, know, I oh, know, and it, it'll always be on the take that's perfect. <laughs> this is your friend. This is probably the number one thing that we use to to address this. It's not perfect though. You can still I can pop through this. Mm -hmm. It, but it helps. There's some layers of stocking basically that help to absorb that puff. Mm -hmm. So it's a big puff coming in, and it, it it's less when it comes through. It might look like this coming in, and it's mm -hmm. sort of there. If your mic is, is right here, you're still going to pop. Sure. You're still going to pop. So yeah. don't think of it as, oh, I've got my pop. And you look, and this is so common. Side on? Yeah. Too close. Too close. Uh -huh. Unless you've got a really good uh, popping technique, I wouldn't put a singer there. No way. Yeah. So here's a couple of things. If you're using a pop filter, put the mic at least that far away, right? So mm -hmm. what's that? Six inches? Sure. Old language? That should be fairly safe. And you can check this with your particular mic because some mics are more uh, robust. Sure. Depends on how their grills design. But on this particular one, which is a really standard bottom of the range road mic, which is an excellent mic, I know I will pop this thing if I'm straight on. Sure. Even that far. Mm -hmm. Here, probably by the time that energy gets to here, it, it's not enough to hit the diaphragm and cause the pop. Another great way to put your mic is actually is to angle it away. Mm -hmm. Not for some reason, I think because we see a lot of pop videos, which sure. by the way, they're not singing. <laughs> so I always smile I'm, I'm when, glad I, you said that. when I see the pop video and he's like singing and the, the, the mic's here, uh -huh. there's no pop filter. Of course you're hearing the recording and this is to help it, you know, for the visuals, right? Yes. Not going to work. In reality, you will probably find that he's no closer than that, really, seriously. The way to get closer, if you want to, is to angle your mic. Mm -hmm. Because plosives are very directional. They, they go straight out. Mm -hmm. So right here, you're going to hit that diaphragm dead on and you're going to pop. Mm -hmm. If you were to do that, that pop's going to go straight underneath it. Sure. You're still relatively the same distance, so your tone mm -hmm. should stay the same. You've got to be a bit careful about the pickup area because, of course, I mean that, your optimum mm -hmm. pickup tone is, is, is in, sort of in frontish, so you've got to be careful. But for years I actually went through a phase where I didn't use a pop filter at all because mm -hmm. some singers find it a bit intrusive. Sure. And I used to record, someone showed me, a great guy that I used to work with, respected fellow in the business, he said, Mike, try this. Uh -huh. It's the same distance and you get fantastic results right there. So if you're looking at it from the front, mm. you put it on the side, it's in the sweet spot, but your pits are going right in front, safely past. You can put it mm. here, you can, you can hang it here, mm -hmm. if you want to read words or something, that's quite good. You can put it underneath. Mm -hmm. It's all Relative. Okay, so here we, we're at the mic in the studio, and th this is exactly what you can do at home with, you don't need a fancy great big stand like this, even an ordinary mic stand can usually 
get your mic up to this level. This is this is a good position I find for vocals. You see, it's got that slight tilt, so that the puff energies, even though this is here, if something were to get through, it's it's not aiming straight at the diaphragm, and that that is is a good distance for for pretty much most vocals I find for me. There, look at that. It's surprisingly far. It's it's not it's not like you see on on that that that's going to pop terribly. Here, you can actually see how this is working. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Look at the energy. It's it's enough to shake this thing. That's what's going to hit this diaphragm if you don't put something in its way. Or another way to record would be to turn on a mic. Always look. There's a little dot which tells you which is the right side of your mic because you know, it can happen that you record on this side and that that's not going to work too well. It happens, don't be embarrassed. Now you see I'm turning the capsule and it's actually that dot's facing this way. This would be another way to record. You could take away this filter completely and if I now sing, see it's slightly to the side, I'm nice and close, the pickup pattern which is a heart shape is still nice and full. I'm, I'm not off axis, so I'm not getting any weird tone and the p are going right past. Safe. P p p no problem. That's not going to pop. P that will pop like crazy because that's going to hit straight like that. So you sing like this or even that much. Probably go. you could go as far as that. That's safe. You get a nice tone. Try that. You can put it down here. If your mic can't get this high, put it underneath. Sing over the top. Just make sure you're singing into the front of your mic. Very important. Something else you've got to be aware of at home, mm -hmm. something called the proximity effect. Mm. Google it. Proximity effect is really important to understand this. The closer you get to a microphone, the more the bass will increase. Naturally, mm -hmm. it's just a physical phenomenon. It's physics. Mm -hmm. I can't explain it. It's too technical. But if you sing and move your mic closer to you, you'll hear it's like someone takes the bass and just turns it up. <laughs> Now this can be a problem, Sure. again, because people like to get close, mm -hmm. maybe because in the cans it sounds good and it mm -hmm. makes you sound deep, but actually you're recording a signal on, onto your door that is too bottom heavy. Sure. And if you don't know what you're doing when you come to mixing and, and know how to cut away a lot of that boominess, because mm -hmm. that's what it ends up sounding, booming, mm. you're going to cause your vocal to sit rather uncomfortably in the mix. Mm -hmm. Because a bottom heavy vocal is, is more difficult to place in a mix that's got things like bass and bottom strings sure. and low notes, material already there, you start to intrude on that area. Mm -hmm. And there's so, a. So watch proximity effect. How would someone balance this with the distance? So at home, usually you're going to pick up some ambient noise, but not in the studio, yes. that sort of thing. So. There's, I think there's a balance maybe to how far someone can precisely, and that is the reason well. people like to get close because your the ratio between what you're singing and the noise mm -hmm. gets greater. So that makes perfect sense. The trade-off, and you can do that if you're now aware of the plosive problem. Mm -hmm. Then the proximity effect, as long as you haven't got proximity with plosive banging, sure. which is a terrible, fatal combination. <laughs> You can EQ out the bottom end. Okay. So if you're getting, if it, it was my advice, if I had a noisy-ish environment with ambient noise, mm -hmm. rather get a, a proximity, bass proximity heavy vocal sure. that's clean, so you, you've, you've taken care of the, of the plosives, uh -huh. you've got, because you can, and we can look at this at another stage, mm. cut away some of that boom mm. and still make the vocal sit like you've got a quieter vocal. Yes. So of the two enemies, I'd say proximity actually can be your friend. Uh -huh. A female vocal that might be thin sure. can benefit from proximity effect because it's a natural way of, of bringing out body. Mm -hmm. If you're a bass fella, you might not want it so much. Sure. So of those two, proximity effect uh, is not as bad as a, as a plosive problem, which is a real, real problem. The third thing we mentioned with problems of vocals, it was... Oh, the mic placement we've discussed, mm -hmm. like I say, get as close as you can uh, where you don't hear the traffic. Ah, oh, <laughs> record in your bedroom. 
rather mm -hmm. than a room which hasn't got as much dense furnishing because a lot of jobs I've had come in that were done. I know one chap in particular records in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. And the sound is great because you've got all that dense bedding mattress material. Sure. You've usually got a carpet and you've got curtains. Mm -hmm. And if you're clever with the way you position yourself and you choose your time, mm. not peak traffic hour, if you've sure. got trucks coming by, fantastic results. Some people like to go into a more ambient environment because it's exciting for them to hear that. You know, it sounds mm. good. Mm -hmm. Not good because you're getting coloration from the bouncing around mm. the room that's actually stuck on that vocal, sure. and you can't get rid of that. And that roomy, booming, mm. roominess, boxiness <laughs> may not be perfect a little bit further down the yeah. track. Experiment with some of these ideas that Mike suggested of, of where to put your mic and where to position that because you may find something that works really well for you, even if it's unconventional, um, or, or one of these placements might just get the tone that you're you're after rather than just saying right I've got my number one best thing that works in every scenario and I think that's really good about what you shared the options of yes. different mic placements and obviously the results you'll get Absolutely. with those as well. And so. the last trick you could try with the room ambience thing uh, if you've got a choice say you've got a corner of the room where you've got some curtains coming in to the corner you've just got curtains in the corner Put yourself in the corner, mm -hmm. facing this mass of absorptive material, mm -hmm. and record there rather than, say, in the middle of the room. Sure. Or, because no one's seeing you, if you've got some mic stands or some, some things that you can stick up, put them up and drape some blankets or something. Mm -hmm. Make a little n niche for yourself and stick your head in it mm -hmm. and put the mic there. It's all good because that's helping to soak up mm. stuff. You can get a commercial thing called a reflex filter, I think, mm -hmm. which is quite expensive, but that's mm -hmm. the principle. It, it, you'll see it's a curved shape mm -hmm. thing of, of, of absorptive material and you put your mic in the middle and mm -hmm. you can make something like that quite effectively mm -hmm. at home. You know. It's great. I, I use one at home when I'm Excellent. recording. I recorded with a friend for um, some demos we were doing and he had a mattress yes. against the wall with uh, it curved over at the top. Perfect. With uh, with blankets hang over the top. So Perfect. It was yeah, it was a nice, a nice little. Uh, Doesn't have to be printed. Exactly. It's exactly right. And I mean, if you look in a fantasy studio setup, although it all looks flash, that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. All these things are out there. They, they're absorbers, and they do it. Mm. All that is just you know, they just made to look mm. flash. So that, you know, you can call yourself professional. Yeah, sure. But it, the principles exactly mm -hmm. the same. So the, the other thing we had was sibilance. sibilance. Right. Sibilance is really right up there with the distortion one uh -huh. as a problem. If you have done a mix and you've got an otherwise good mix, but mm -hmm. you've got a vocal that's sibilant, mm -hmm. it's a hell of a job for your mastering guy to master the whole track globally and deal with that overly bright sibilant vocal. So, because generally when we when we treat a final mix, there's a little bit of sweetening that happens in those mm -hmm. high frequencies to make everything sound a little bit sweeter. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you've got a nightmare scenario of a overly bright sibilant vocal mm -hmm. and an average or dullish backing, mm -hmm. wow, mm -hmm. big problem. So just what what is sibilance sibilance exactly? Is almost describes it by the sound. Sibilant. It's all the S, the mainly S sounds and mm -hmm. T's as well. So, as humans, when we make an S sound, there's a lot of high f energy on an S mm -hmm. sound. In fact, if you zoom in on a wave file of a vocal, you can actually learn to identify the S's by this sure. dense little cluster of uh -huh. nasties. And if you have got a microphone that tends to push up your high frequencies, which a lot of mics at the home level do, they mm -hmm. they put a lift. Of the treble in the response of the mic to make you sound nice and bright mm. and clear. So if you've got that already boosting you and you're already naturally producing too much sibilance. Mm -hmm. Women are supposed to be worse than men but I've had some sibilant men as well so it kind of works for men and mm. women both male and female vocals. Every time an S or a T comes along you get this horrible jumping out of 
of brightness. It's brittle. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And of course, everyone loves a bit of top end on the vocal. So that gets a dose. Sure. Sibilance going up even more. So you've had a boost from your mic, you've had a little boost from your EQ, because it, it does mm -hmm. make you sound nice. You get that sure. airy sound. Everyone, I've never uh -huh. known anyone turn the treble down and go, that sounds better. Sure. So you've got all that. Then you come to master it, and of course you're adding your nice little bit of air over everything. Mm -hmm. And so you've had kind of three stages of boost. Another reason why you've got to be careful with your mic place. Sibilance can, to some extent, be controlled by how you place your mic. Okay. So experiment. Put your headphones on and turn up the volume a wee bit and do something that's really sibilant. She sells seashells on the seashore would be a good one. Look with a sure. lot of S's. And just go around and find a place where you can maybe hear a little less of the sizzling. Mm -hmm. Start there. Avoid your mics like your dynamic mics like SM58s that have got more of a boost than mm -hmm. something like this, a condenser mic, which sure. is flatter, right? So don't buy a mic that, that's very bright to start with, because that's sure. not going to help you. So that'll that'll help. Then you need to get a plug-in called a de-esser. Mm -hmm. There's some free ones to download. Sure. And the way they work is that every time they see an S come along, mm -hmm. they actually dip the volume briefly. So okay. you can see right. it working. So uh -huh. here comes an S. And it, you can see, it's like a little guy is sitting there somehow magically anticipating every nasty and pulling down the fader and then pushing it up before the next word that doesn't have an S comes along. And if you set it right, don't overdo it, because a de that works too hard creates a hilarious lisping effect. Okay. Lisp. So every uh -huh. F that comes along disappears. Uh -huh. So... <laughs> You can see when someone's just bought a DS a plug in, everything's like lisping and there's no S's in it. Sure. So you learn. You want to drop maybe six or eight dBs, I find. That, that's the uh -huh. amount of dip you can set. So it should leave your vocal alone. When you're singing without S's, nothing's happening. And then an S comes along and it just does a nice dip. Mm -hmm. That is going to mean that you can then put treble on your vocal. Sure. But because you've brought down the S's mm -hmm. before you do that, Everything gets an even amount of treble boost. Mm. And I tell you what, I DS thoroughly. <laughs> sure. Every vocal. Uh -huh. I wouldn't advise you do it as you're recording. So don't stick it in the path of your recording on the way mm -hmm. to your door because then if you overdo it, you're stuck with it. Record it with sibilance, mm -hmm. overly bright. And then when you're playing it back, insert a DS a plug in on that vocal track. And experiment until you get just enough of that nasty, mm. sizz it, it's, it's a sizzling sound mm -hmm. that you want to get. And T's are nasty too. T's are, mm -hmm. can be really, you know, powerful little birds. So get the, the S's and the T's under control with some careful use. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when you, when you mix your track, everything benefits. So there's a good example on See No More. You can see if I stop. The road, but I can't see no more. As the C comes along, it's dipping. The road, but I can't see no more. There you go. And that's all it takes to drop. Now, 7 dB is a lot in, in, in audio terms. That's a fairly hefty little dip that it's put in. And that's just enough to tame that sibilance. And that's an that's easy way to do it. When you put reverb on your vocal, an un vocal will have a lot of shimmering reverb on all the S's. Mm -hmm. Shh! Sure. Because that vocal is triggering your reverb. So if you've de or you are at the same time de your vocal before it goes to the reverb, mm -hmm. everything's good. That reverb is not going to be so sizzly as well. Mm -hmm. You've got to watch all these things. So those are, we've discussed uh, your distortion of your mic going into your preamp, mm -hmm. your, your interface. We've talked about the proximity effect and plosives, mm -hmm. that puffing, popping, and we've talked about where to put the mic to minimize both of those issues and sibilance. Those are the four big bugbears mm -hmm. that people that do what I do have to deal with when we get mm -hmm. recordings that are otherwise excellent. At mm -hmm. time. Keep it up. Don't stop doing it. The recording performance is the artistic element. Is mm. often just brilliant. Because the mm -hmm. people are relaxed. They're at home. They're not spending money. Everything's good. Mm. And the performance is musically beautiful. But they are ruined by these 
Imagine that. I mean, a beautiful performance mm. with a lousy pop mm -hmm. in three places. Mm. It just wrecks the mood. Mm -hmm. Or sizzles that are cutting your head off because <laughs> of the sibilance. Or even worse, that big note in the bridge mm. clipping. Mm -hmm. Bam. <laughs> Fix those things. You've got a release quality track. Mm -hmm. No reason why you can't do it. Awesome. My pleasure. Thanks, Mike, for... Um, chatting through that, it's awesome. I hope you all found a lot of value in that and I recommend going and seeing what Mike does at manukastudios.co.nz and I'll put a link down below so that they can find you and, uh, and obviously as well if, if you've got tracks that um, you want mastered or are putting out then obviously it's part of what Mike does but really appreciate your time and, and chatting through that. It's been and a pleasure, thank you though. Look forward to sharing some of all of your comments back with Mike as well of uh, some new tracks and uh, some upgrades on your recording. <laughs> Cheers. We were talking about a good mic, you know, for home. There's probably nothing better than this if, if you can. This is, I don't work for Rode, I'm not affiliated, but I can highly recommend. This is a package they sell that I think if you're lucky, you can look on Trade Me. I think I picked this up for about $200, $250. It's not a lot of money. You get a lot for that. You get the Rode condenser mic, which is very, very quiet, very good. You get the shock mount which can help keep noises out if you're at home because it picks up vibrations and gets rid of them. It comes with a, a pop filter which I've taken off because I don't need it in here that attaches here that gives you a pop filter so you get a pop filter, a shock mount, a very good mic and a six meter cable all for, for a couple of hundred dollars maybe 250. If you need a pair of headphones decent to close over that don't leak don't use the open back ones and an ordinary mic stand. There you go. With something like that, you can re produce a really, really good quality vocal at home.